Graduating class of 2020, I am Pastor David, and I am so excited for you guys. You are crossing the finish line, and so maybe you didn't get the opportunity to cross the stage and grab your diploma that way, but look, you put in the hard work and you're here. Um, and so I just want to take a moment to congratulate you and to share from the heart here in a minute, but I want to take a second and just talk to the parents um, as one who has has a son who's graduated a couple of years ago. Oh my gosh, how much of a wreck are you? Um, especially, I think it's maybe for the first child. Um, but man, I tell you, it was just heartbreaking to see my baby boy, my buddy, now turning his tassel and getting his diploma because that means that's the end of a chapter. It means that really as a parent, we've done everything that we can do or can't do. And now, our little one is no longer a little one. They're a young man, they're a young woman, and we now have to shove them out of the nest because if we do their, our job correctly, they are supposed to leave our houses. And some parents are very excited and other parents are a little bit sad and maybe other parents are a little bit mixed in both. They're excited to see you go, but they still love you. We'll see you over the holidays, right? But I just wanna take a moment just to thank the parents and the coaches, the teachers, the grandparents, and all the people that really have worked on your behalf to get you to where you are today. And so I would encourage you as a graduate to be mindful that you didn't get to where you are by yourself. There was a lot of people cheering you on, investing in you, and really making sure that you got to where you needed to go. And so here you are. And as your pastor, I just wanted to take a moment just to share with you a little bit from my heart. If you and I were at Starbucks and uh, maybe having uh, a great drink, a great caramel macchiato, whatever type drink, and we're sitting there, um, maybe we would start talking about what was next for you. And, and maybe you would just be like, you know, man, I, I got a lot of things in front of me. I'm excited. And then maybe other students I've talked to, they're like, I don't know what's next. But either way, depending on where you're at, I have something I want to share with you. Um, because I want you just to imagine we're sitting in those overstuffed leather chairs. And maybe you said, David, what would be some parting advice that you would give me as someone who has already lived and kind of gone through this season, what would you warn me against? What would be the things that you would want me to keep in mind? And so that's kind of what I wanted to share with you today is just imagine we're sitting there and we're just having a conversation. Um, and, I, and this is what I would tell you. I would tell you first off, as your friend, as your much older friend, um, or as a father, or, or as your pastor, um, what I would begin to start sharing with you is this. I would say, look, let's, let's just look at your life here up to this point. Over the last 18 years, you're 17, 18, 19 years old right now. Nothing warms my heart more than cold statistics. Uh, but let me just share with you a snapshot of your life right now, okay? First off, you have lived approximately, uh, approximately 18 years, okay? Of those 18 years, you have been in school around 2,100 days, which blows my mind. You've spent 12,000, close to 13,000 hours in class. Now, this statistic does not reflect whether or not you were alert and awake or paying attention, but you were present in class for about 13,000 hours. That translates into 777,000 minutes. 777,000 minutes. You've been around for 216 months on this little round rock called the Earth. You've been breathing for 936 weeks. You've been here occupying space for 157,000 hours. Of those 157,000 hours, you've actually slept 52,000 of them. You've watched TV for 12,000 hours, statistically speaking. You've spent 7,500 hours eating food, like literally nothing else but 7,500. And the majority of those hours were spent actually probably eating Hot Pockets and Funyuns and uh, Flaming Fire Cheetos or something. Um, but I share this with you because if you keep going at this rate, which we all pray and hope that you do, and you live the average lifespan of 70 years, here's what you're probably going to look like in terms of how you spent your time. You will have slept 24 of those 70 years. That's a lot of sleep, y'all, and I'm a fan of sleep, but 24, man, that's a lot. Work for 14 years, uh, combined total. Eat food, six years. Driving in your car, five years. Talking, just saying stuff. Ordering food through the drive-through, all of that's accounted in about four years. You're gonna spend two years, over two years in the bathroom. 
alone with your life. That's where you're going to be investing two of those 70 years. And I could go on and on, but why do I share this stuff with you? Because although you can't see it now, I cannot begin to tell you how quickly, just how fast, all of those hours of sleeping and eating and bathroom using are going to go by in your life. And I say this from personal experience, trust me, but here's the thing, when you're still, if you look back, depending on when you were born, um, it was probably, well, golly, that was probably around 2002, which blows my mind. By that point, I was actually in my early 30s in 2002. And so while you were still forming one words or one syllable words, um, and learning how to write your name, I was actually taking my first steps into my 30s. And what I would tell you is I was living my adult life, and I'd spent about a decade, right, in my 20s, uh, trying to figure out my life, trying to figure out what was next for me. And so there was just a lot of just these weird zigs and zags. And in the, in the course of my 20s, I got married, I became a parent, um, I became a, a professional musician, and I, all of these other things. And now... I'm at the, I'm, I'm close to 50. I'll be 50 years old next year. Been married for going on 25 years. I have two kids now, thank Jesus. And I bring this up because time's gonna fly just as fast for you as it has for me. And what I'm begging you to do, if we're sitting at Starbucks having these coffees in the chairs, I would just simply first off tell you, use your time wisely. And I know that you've heard that before, but here's why I say that. Because I've learned in my life that time is really unforgiving. Time really doesn't allow for a lot of do-overs. And so what I mean is, is that your decisions really need to be the right ones. Because opportunities are going to come and go. And how you respond to those opportunities will determine and set the course for your life. For better or for worse. No pressure, right? But here you are, you're closing a chapter, a huge chapter of your life. And what you're about to do is, you're, whether you like it or not, you're going to be starting a new one here pretty soon. And so if you are around 18, up to this point, you've had a lot of book knowledge, okay? You've had a lot of people investing in you. And most of what you have experienced has been book knowledge, but maybe you've been raised in a Christian home or have been raised in church. And so you have some biblical knowledge as well. So that's great. But here's the key. How you apply what you have learned will actually determine how you pass this final exam called life. John Adams put it this way. He said, there's two types of education. He said, one type of education teaches us how to make a living, but another type of education teaches us how to live. So your education up to this point has taught you the basics, right? Um, you've made it up to this point, and maybe your education has even helped you kind of figure out what field you want to step into or what your next steps are for your career or your calling. But it's only what Jesus teaches us. What I would tell you is that it's through his word is how he will show you how to live. And this is important to be get, be, get to be able to hear today because the finest university on the planet can show you how to make a living. But you know what the finest university on the planet can't do? It can't tell you how to live. It can't show you how to live life to the fullest that Jesus came to be able to give us. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. And so God's plan for your life is for you to experience life not just endear it and endear it and get to the end of it and then go, okay, well, I don't know what that was all about. I can't wait to go to heaven. No, there's so much for you. And there's so much that God has ahead for you in your life and in your future. So knowing how to live actually is going to be of far greater value to you in the end than how to make a living. And I say that because there's a lot of people that are making great livings in this world and they do not know how to live. Learn how to live and your living will make a lot more sense. And so if you take anything from what I shared to, with you today, everything really boils down to two things I'm going to ask you to do. Number one, remain faithful to what you have been taught by in, the, in the ways of the Lord and remember God. Those are the two things that I would tell you. You see 2 Timothy 3.14 says, but we must remain faithful to the things that we have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. 
All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us how to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. In other words, you've been taught, you've been invested in. Now it's time for you to take the word of God for yourself. And understand that it's going to show you what's wrong with your life so you can fix it. And it's also going to show you how to live the life that Jesus made you and designed you to be able to live. For what purpose? To prepare and equip you for every good work and plan that God has in store for you in your new chapters and your next steps. And so stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to the teachings of his word. There's going to be people who think that they're smarter than God. There's going to be people that come across your path that think that they're smarter than the Bible. Pay attention to them and really don't give them the voice that they are demanding that they have in your life. Because the reality is this. God is the one who has the final word. Allow him to be the final word in your life. And so there's going to be people with very strong opinions about all sorts of stuff. And so where do you find the answers? The answers are going to be rooted in God's word because it can be trusted, because God can be trusted. And so stay rooted in his word. And so what does this really look like? What does it look like to continue to pursue this life of following Jesus? What I would tell you, it starts with passion. It's saying, God, I want to be passionate for the things that you're passionate for. When we begin to align our passions with the passions of God, what will happen is your purpose, your destiny, your calling, whatever you want to call that, will begin to open up and reveal itself to you. Um, that's how it works. And so we must be passionate about the things of God so that we can discover our own passions in light of what he has designed us to do. And so I would encourage you, first and foremost, just be passionate for Jesus. Go deeper in your relationship with him. Follow him with greater fervor and power and, and humility. And your passion will develop, which will unveil your calling and your purpose. So you don't have to wander around on this earth trying to figure out what am I here for. The other thing, though, is from that passion, you begin to pray and you begin to intercede towards the things that God has given you passions about. Which means that you begin to develop a heart for the things that God has a heart for. And that comes through prayer and intercession. Intercession is praying for on the behalf of other people, other situations. And so, yes, you pray for yourself and your needs, but you also develop this heart of an intercessor who pleads on the behalf of God, on the behalf of, uh, to God, on the behalf of others and other broken situations. But from that, you begin to consecrate yourself. This is a picture of someone setting themselves apart for a very specific purpose that God has already determined. And so consecrating yourself is saying, listen, you see the world, you're not here to judge the world, but you're making a decision not to incorporate your life into the common template of the world. Where the world says, listen, you have to have these experiences. You need to have this type of car, this type of purse, this type of house, this type of spouse, these types of things in order to be successful. You have to have this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And then you get to the end of your life and you go, my life was just a carbon copy of everybody else. No, God has uniquely designed you. And the way that you can determine your unique calling and your place in this world is by not aligning yourself with it, but being in it and consecrating yourself, but not being a part of it. And then from that, your mission will come alive. And the things that you long to be able to do and the callings and the purposes that God has already instilled in you are going to come alive. And now you will be able to pursue and live out your purpose, your God-given purpose. And so, I mean, think about it for a second. This is really a big deal because if you think about an athlete, for example, you can prepare an athlete, you can equip them to do all the right things, you can show them all the right form, all the things, buy them the best shoes, buy them the best equipment. But if that athlete never actually enters into the race, right, or doesn't apply what they know, like we just read in 2 Timothy, to apply the things that we've been taught, then what was the point? You can invest in an athlete, but if they don't actually get into the race, if they don't actually wrestle with fatigue and sweat and, and uh, being tired and the, the hot sun beating down on them, if they don't put into action what they've learned, then what type of athlete are they really? 
They looked the part, they were prepared, but it's getting into the race is what determines if you win it or not. And so you've been invested in. You've had a lot of people give you a lot of time. And parents, lots and lots of money, right? Invested into our kiddos. And also the teaching, the biblical instruction. So the question isn't for many of us, have I been trained? Have I been invested? And the question will be, no, are you ready now to get into the race that God has had planned for you now that you're a young adult and you can begin to make your own decisions? You see, what decides this is going to come down to one word. It's going to be up to you. It's your choice. The word is choice. I mean, all of us have chosen to whether to have a relationship with Jesus or not. That's a choice. Jesus chose to die on the cross for our sins. That was a choice. Jesus chose to forgive us of our sins. That was a choice of Jesus. So, so choices are powerful. And there were those that, I mean, here's the thing. Your parents are probably watching this. They made a choice to get together. And because these two random human beings decided to come together and become and join their life together, guess what? Through certain choices, you showed up, right? Choices are powerful, and because of that, we have to understand that there's a tremendous power in our choice. And the reality is this, as a graduate, you have a big bucket of choices in front of you. And how you choose will determine the course of your life. And especially over the next six months, here's the thing, you're going to be making more choices than you've ever made in your life. Where to live, where to go to school, who to date, what car to buy. I mean, all sorts of crazy choices. But here's the thing. You know what I've learned? It's not the big monumental choices that are the biggest ones uh, or that have the greatest impact. You know what has the greatest impact? It's the things that seem small, the little choices. It's the smallest choices that seem insignificant at the time, right? Each day though, as you make little choices, you have to understand it begins to pave the way to your purpose or your destiny or paves the way to many questions and someone not determining or ever finding out what they were put on this planet to do. It's the little choices. It will be your choice in how you love God and love people. That seems insignificant from a day-to-day -day basis, but it will determine the course and the outcome of your life. How you choose to live that out, because how you choose to love God through prayer, through intercession, consecration, living on mission, these types of things, will ultimately determine who you wind up marrying. It will determine how, where you're going to live, what your career will be, how many kids you're going to have. And you go, oh my gosh, he's talking about kids. Yes, because some of you watching are going to be parents in less than five years. You're going to be straight up in a minivan with two kids in the back before you know it. It happens really quickly. But here's the thing. You've been called to one purpose, and that is to love God and to love people. And so we do this largely by living out this thing called the Great Commission as we finish up today. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says this. He said, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given you. And be sure of this. Jesus says, listen, as you now, as a new disciple, step out and then begin to fulfill your calling as a disciple maker. And I know you may not see yourself as one today, but this is what Jesus is empowering you to do, is to make disciples, to be able to pour in and invest in those who are younger in the faith than you are, to show them also how to follow Jesus and show them also how to develop their passion and their prayer life and live in consecration and live out their life of mission. This is what Jesus says, and he says, I will be with you. I will be with you until the end of the age. And so that is your purpose. Your purpose is to love God, to love people, and to make disciples. And so with that said, as we wrap up, I want to warn you, because Scripture gives us a warning. Because Hebrews 3.13 says, You must warn each other every day while it's still called today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin or hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, Trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. And so what we see here is there's this urgency. And while it is called today, and today is the day that is called today, for if we are faithful to the end, 
So this is a long road of faithfulness. Are you going to mess up? Yes. Are you going to stumble and fall? Of course you are. But we get back up because we trust God just as firmly as when we first believed, as we are today, as we will tomorrow. And then we can share in all that belongs to Christ. And part of what belongs to Christ is your destiny. With that said, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. 1 Corinthians tells us that we have to be careful not to fall away from our faith. The reality is, is statistically speaking, 80% of great Christian kids that were raised in church leave the church and graduate from their faith. And it's a, it's a crazy statistic. And the thing is, is that that statistic is brought up every single year around this time. The thing is, though, those 80% that fall away and, and graduate from their faith because they're pulled into the current of our culture are sitting here watching it going, that will never happen to me. But what I've learned is that pursuing God, getting plugged into a church, biblical community becomes a second semester pursuit that never really takes place. And so you're going to be faced with a lot of exciting things in this next season, right? As you start college, you're going to start your school, your classes, buying books, buying cars, finding your new boo or shorty, whatever it is that you're going to, yes, I said that. Well, but whether, whatever you're going to be doing, and church is going to feel very insignificant, getting plugged into biblical community and staying connected with the Lord. And I've seen so many students fall into the temptation of going, oh, I'll get involved and plugged in next semester. And the next semester never comes. And so I'm warning you right now because 1 Corinthians says these things happen to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. It says this. If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. In other words, if in this moment you're spiritually strong, do not become arrogant and think that you won't face trials and temptations and, and traps that would attempt to be able to steal your faith and your, your vision and put it on something else besides God. You see, Scripture goes on to say that the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. So when you are tempted, it's going to happen this coming year for you. He will show you a way out that you, so that you can endure. And so my prayer is that all of you who are watching as a graduate, you would be statistic breakers. I believe that you are. And I just want to close by reminding you to not only remain faithful to God, but the other thing is to remember God. Ecclesiastes 12 says this. Don't let the excitement of your youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, oh, life is not pleasant anymore. Remember him before the light of the sun, the moon and the stars is dim in your old eyes and rain clouds continually darken your sky. Remember him before your legs, the guards of your house start to tremble and before your shoulders, the strong men begin to stoop. Remember God before your teeth, your few remaining servants stop grinding, and before your eyes, the women looking through windows see dimly. Remember him before the doors to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise at the first chirping of the birds, and then all their sounds will ultimately one day grow faint. Remember God before you become fearful of falling or worrying about danger in the streets. Before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper. This is the word of God, by the way. And all the caperberry no longer inspires sexual desire. It's for another sermon for another time, but there it is. Remember him before you get near your grave. Your everlasting home when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now while you are still young before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken from the well. For then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And so this really paints a picture of urgency. And it also paints a picture that nothing lasts forever. And so this is a picture of going, remember God 
Don't become arrogant and foolish into thinking that you're going to live forever. You have one life. You have one opportunity. You have one purpose. You have one destiny that God has determined for you. And so bear in mind, remain faithful to God. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful, but remain faithful to him in your choices, the small and the big, your relationships. Seek the Lord first in his kingdom and all of these other things, scripture says, will be added unto you. Not only be faithful to God, but remember him. Remember that it's he who gave you your spirit. It's he who has designed and ordered the, the steps of your days. And so allow him to guide you. Allow him to show you his love for you. Allow God to walk with you throughout this life and into this new season that God has for you. So I want to pray a blessing over you right now as we finish up. Psalm 20 says this, and so in Jesus' name, I declare this over the graduating class of 2020. In times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. May he grant you your heart's desires and make all of your plans succeed. May we shout for joy at Grace Point West. When we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of the Lord, our God, may the Lord answer your every prayer in Jesus name. So I pray God's blessings over you. I'm proud of you. Grace Point West is cheering you on. And we're so thankful for what you've done up to this point and the things that God is going to do in you and through you. So be blessed. Thank you for taking this time to hear my heart. And I hope to see you again very soon. Keep us updated with what you're doing. Love you.